I'm Nikki Jankola Shanks, and you're listening to Making Sense of Money, a podcast dedicated to making financial topics easier to understand. Unfortunately, Jake Hamilton is missing right now, but I mean, he's I'm- not missing. We like know <laughs> where he is. Yes, he's not like a missing person, but right. he is not joining us right now. He might later for the podcast recording. Um, but we just wanted to mention that last episode, we talked about unemployment as part of our mini series on economic indicators. And if you're interested in how unemployment and employment rates are used as one of the many metrics we look at to measure how an economy is doing, please go ahead and check that out. And you probably noticed I'm Andrea Pellegrini. <laughs> if you've been listening to this podcast for any amount of time or any previous episodes of the podcast. But today we're going to be talking about a topic that a lot of people view as a big part of the American dream, buying a home. And the pandemic has had an interesting impact on the housing market over the past couple of years. So we'll kind of explore how that might impact your buying or renting decisions. So even though we're going to focus pretty much on the home buying process, we do want to give a little context to the past couple of years in the housing market with some data, especially as Andrew just mentioned, the pandemic has had a very interesting impact. So according to an article from the U.S. Census Bureau in October 2021, the housing market kind of stopped in March of 2020 when the United States went into lockdown at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. If you think back to that time, you know, everything was shut down. So it makes sense. So, so was real estate. I mean, I know from working at IDFPR that there were other, there was a lot um, of protocols put in place on what real realtors could do real, you know, in terms of showings and things like that. So not, not a surprise. By the summer hit, more people were ready to buy homes but with a little bit different perspective than prior to the pandemic. So Zillow used their own data with the Census Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics, and American Community Survey data to identify nearly 2 million renters unable to afford homes in metro areas could now afford to buy homes farther out because they no longer had to commute to work. Farther out being that the from where their job location was. So for example, for me, I used to have to to go downtown Chicago every single day. Currently I'm not doing that. We don't know how long my our situation is going to last, but I know a lot of my friends are in the same boat where, oh well I don't have to live in the city right now. Maybe I could move out to somewhere where it's a little bit less expensive or a different neighborhood that I didn't think that I could before. And even some people that are now moving back to hybrid work is a lot easier for them to justify two days of a long commute rather than five days of a super long commute. Exactly. And we also saw a reduction in the amount of homes available for purchase in 2020. So it made the market really competitive for buyers. This meant that home values went up and have been up even through 2021, and that competitiveness is still there as well today. Um, yeah. I know friends who are trying to buy houses right now, and it's like the house comes on the market that they see and they like. By the time they schedule an appointment for like the next day, the house has already been pulled as contingent. Yeah, because people are just crazy. Gotta right move now. fast right now. Fast. Um, I actually uh, was with some friends the other week and he lives in Wilmette and he was saying that they've gotten cold offers on their house. Their house isn't even up for sale, but people will like be like, what? And he's like, we're not selling our house. We just moved here. <laughs> I have a friend in Champaign when she saw how competitive the market was, she considered selling her house, but then she was like, but then I don't know where I will live. Right. <laughs> so that's another consideration if, if you're looking yeah. to sell. 
I don't know if I'm going to be able to find another house, right? Or even rental property sometimes. Right. So if you're listening to this, you may be someone who is ready to buy your first home or you're looking to move into a new home, especially if you're making that career change like we talked about in the unemployment episode we just did. Either way, having kind of a basic idea of the process, some of the terms that are a little unique to buying a home, who all the players are in the home buying process, and a few ways to protect yourself during the home buying process are all good things to be aware of. And things have just shifted over the past few years. There's new terminology, there's new legislation. We're not gonna go over everything. We're gonna keep it basic, right? That's what we said. <laughs> um, we're gonna try. <laughs> we're, we're gonna try. Uh, there are lots of ways to buy a home uh, and there's lots of types of homes out there. And like we said, the regulations and the procedures, they differ by location. So we're going to keep it pretty high level. We're going to try to keep it as simple as we can. Um, so let's get into it. So generally, when you go to buy a home, there are certain steps that you can either take simultaneously, or you might want to do some steps before other steps. It depends on where you're buying, what kinds of hurdles you're running into, all kinds of things. So I'll talk about some of the steps that you might take generally in order to buy a home. So first you wanna kind of decide whether renting or buying is better for you. And there are a lot of factors that go into that, but that's kind of the first step before deciding to actually buy a home. And then the second step is to prepare to purchase a home. So you'll want to start off by tracking some of your expenses, the ones you have now, um, kind of analyzing what those expenses you've already tracked are to get a good idea of what your lifestyles budget is, right? You're, when you go to buy a home, you, mo you might not be able to change all of your lifestyle habits if you eat out several times a week, right? Um, and that's an important factor when you're going to determine how much of a home that you can purchase and still afford your lifestyle. You'll also want to check your credit reports and start working on either improving your credit worthiness if you have to take out a loan, if that hasn't been a priority for you already, um, or maintaining good credit. And if you haven't already started saving for a down payment, um, and some of the other closing costs or moving costs, you'll wanna start doing that too. And that amount is going to differ depending on where you're buying, what kinds of anticipated costs that you have, which can vary regionally or even across communities, even local communities. Like um, the last time that I looked it up, the cost of living for home costs for Champaign where I live, now is like 40% higher than just 45 minutes away in Decatur where my hometown is. So that's not very far away, but the cost of living, especially for buying a home, is way different. Yes, and that's definitely true up here yes. as well. So I live in one of the western suburbs of Chicago, and even within my own little suburb, depending where you are, it, it could differ greatly. So um, it's definitely something to consider when you're looking at your big picture. Absolutely. So once you take those steps, you'll also want to build kind of your hypothetical budget, right? Um, that's once you're able to kind of sort or track and analyze your expenses, you can build that hypothetical budget that would include some additional costs that you may not have experienced while renting, for instance, like mortgage costs, homeowner association fees or HOA fees, utilities, emergency fund savings might be a little bit more intense when you own a home. Uh, there might be new lifestyle cost changes, like you might decide to buy a home because you want to do like rep personal repairs to your home, right? If that's a new cost for you and that's what you're excited about, you'll have to budget for it. 
Um, and within the mortgage costs, you might also have taxes, insurance, and private mortgage insurance included. And those are different costs we'll talk about later. Um, and it's important to remember that even if you buy a home outright, you're still going to have ongoing costs of taxes, homeowner and homeowner's insurance. So those two costs, they're going to persist even after your mortgage is paid off or if you purchase a house with cash. And then another step is to explore your loan options and compare loan options or lenders. So this is, um, you might be doing this simultaneously to looking at homes, but you can start looking at homes at any time. But if you wait until you have pre-approvals from lenders, you'll have more leverage when you go to make an offer. You can sometimes move faster. We just talked about how competitive the market is, right? So if you have pre-approvals for loans, you can move, move things a little bit faster. Like we said, right now, a lot of homes are still selling super fast. So if someone puts an offer in with a pre-approval and you don't have one, they may just decide to sell the person who has taken the steps to secure funding for purchasing a home rather than entertain your offer. And you may decide to get a pre-approval and then decide to shop around and compare loan options after you make an offer even. So those are some things that you might wanna consider as well. And then you get a look at homes, right? This is either the most fun or the most frustrating part of the process, depending on the type of person you are. When I started searching for my home, I made a spreadsheet uh, to compare all the homes. And I named the homes based on what my first impressions of the houses were that I looked like. So my husband and I named one the Asian Persuasion House because it smelled like Asian food. I just did laughing for those of you guys that don't know Andrea and have never received one of her spreadsheets. Oh my gosh. That I, this, none of this is surprising to me. Uh, we also named one the Wavy, Wavy House, the Ocean Floor House, because when we walked in, the, the floor was wavy. Yeah. 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 My realtor loved our naming conventions, but it made it a lot more tolerable to compare all these houses and remember which one we were talking about. We were talking about the pros and cons of different houses that we looked at. And then after you do all those steps, you can make an offer. <laughs> so having your own realtor as a buyer, right, can help serve as a buffer um, when you make an offer. So you aren't trying to negotiate with the seller or the seller's real estate agent directly. And it's an emotional process to make an offer because it's a huge purchase. Having a buffer is helpful sometimes for the negotiation process. And then after that, if you have your offer accepted, um, this is when you prepare to close. This is when you start to meet even more people besides your realtor um, or your lender that will be responsible for helping you purchase your home. You may even choose to hire more people to help you than just the realtor and the lender or a lawyer. So there's lots of other players. Sometimes that's even required depending on who your lender is or where you live or choose to live. So these are just like the general steps that I took to buy my house like seven or eight years ago. But Nikki, kind of what was your experience? So my experience was a little bit different than Andrea's just because, well, like generally it was the same. I did not have a spreadsheet. It's just not how I roll. But it's just easier for me to organize my thoughts because I started out trying it without a spreadsheet. And then I was like, I've worked at, I've looked at like 20 places. I can't remember some of them. So, um, what I, what I will say is it's a little, my experience is a little bit different because I was buying with someone. So my now husband and I were buying our home together. So we started looking when we were engaged. So that way we could like 
be engaged look we were gonna and we wanted to to move into our house around the time that we were getting married like we didn't we had already made the decision we got married later in life so like we were older um that we didn't want to rent like we were ready to kind of pick a house that we could and we didn't also if we could we had made the decision with within our budget that you know if if we could find a house that was in our budget that was like our quote forever home as opposed to a starter house we would like that because we were getting married and like I said we were we were you know in in our late 30s so it, it was a little bit different um than other people who may be getting married right yeah and so, I made my decision by myself there wasn't like that back and forth of someone else because I was buying it by myself like I brought along my now husband who was my boyfriend at the time just to get his perspective right because I didn't want to buy a home that he would be uncomfortable with especially since he's super tall right and there were some houses where I was like he wouldn't be able to go up the stairs at this house (laughs) so once we kind of made that decision it definitely kind of drove what we were looking at because looking for something like we knew we didn't want a two bedroom house. That's just, you know, we, we wanted to be able to kind of have a house that we could grow into. And, um, we also, I was very lucky that, you know, once we started, I, I'm not going to lie. I found everything about the home buying process, the most stressful, like planning the wedding. Yeah. Stressful, but not like like everything about buying a house was the most stressful for me. And between the amount of money you're spending and all the stuff you have to go through, it's just a lot. So um, when I like kind of let it be known that this is where we were headed, um, I'm lucky that I had one of my very best friends from high school. She had done this about a few years prior to me. And so she had uh, a mortgage guy she's like, go talk to him. He's great. He made everything super easy to understand. So when we started, even before we really started looking at houses, we met with him and he was wonderful. Like he created an entire spreadsheet for us that showed us, um, with formulas that kind of showed us, he would like input how much we were making, what our combined incomes were, you know, what roughly would we, can we estimate expenses per month would be for gas and water and et cetera. And then he would, he had all these formulas figured out. So then he could input, okay, if you have this much for a down payment, this is how much your, about your monthly mortgage would be. And he like had this all broken out. So for me, I'm a very visual person. So it really helped us figure out what range we were looking in realistically for a house. Um, And then at the same time, I had met a friend of mine actually through working out at the gym and she is a real estate agent. So I contacted her and she helped and she put together a ton of listings for us. Plus we looked at, I'm things on Redfin, which a lot of times she already had that house, you know, but we went to a lot of houses and, and it was really hard. It was really hard for us to figure out what we wanted. Like, I think in the beginning, we went to almost too many houses and she was like, all right, we need to like refocus you. What, what are you looking for? And she was able to kind of point out certain things that like we didn't, she's like, you have not once liked a house that had, that wasn't slow level in some way, you know, like stuff like that. So it it was very, and because I knew her and I was friends with her, I trusted her. So like, she was like, all right, you're going to need to bring a lawyer to closing. Do you have a lawyer? No, I didn't have a lawyer. So she (laughs) was like, here's somebody I work closely with, you know, stuff like that. So it was, it was, that was kind of our experience. Um, We did actually have we made an offer on one house and had a terrible inspection and um, then backed out and then got a, a different house. So 
that is something that does happen. Yeah. Um, so it was kind of my, my experience, but to get back into to some of the more basics, um, if you're kind of overwhelmed with everything already, the CFPB, the con Consumer, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, Consumer Financial <laughs> Protection Bureau um, has a really great webpage on buying a house with checklists for all of the financial steps of buying a home. So we'll make sure to link that in the show notes. Um, and it's also important to really stress that buying isn't going to be the best option for everyone. A home as your pri primary residence is a liability and asset. Even though a lot of people say owning a home is an investment, there are a lot of factors that can go into its value as an asset. Unless you're renting it out and making income from it, it's not really considered an investment. So that's why the first step is usually to determine if renting or buying is best for your situation. So if you're trying to figure out like what you need to consider when determining if renting or buying is better for you. It's going to be very much based on your individual situation and how you're feeling, but there's two things that you might want to consider. And one of the things is equity. Um, equity is the difference between what the market value of a home is and the amount of money that you owe on it. Essentially, it's the wealth that you hold in your home. Um, if the values of homes in an area that you're looking to live in would not allow you to build equity because like the home values are going down um, or the costs of ownership would be so high, it may not be a good time to buy, for example. Um, I've had friends that I've over the past several years that have lost so much equity from the 2008 crisis um, that they never recover, they never built home equity again in their home they originally purchased. So they had to sell it at a loss, at a significant loss sometimes. And that's some like one factor that you might wanna consider depending on where you're looking to buy or what kind of financial situation that you're in right now. Um, the other thing you might want to consider is um, a lot of people think that you'll save money on taxes if you own a home, um, but, and that's because of the, the mortgage interest deduction that you can um, file on your taxes, which allows homeowners to deduct some or all of their interest that they pay on their mortgage from federal income taxes. But Contrary to popular belief, it does not help all homeowners save on your taxes. So that's something to consider as well. If that's your primary reason for buying a house is to save money on taxes, you may not save money on taxes. So that's another kind of thing to consider. There's also like lots of calculators out there that you can use to determine both the short and long-term financial costs of renting versus buying. And we can put a couple examples in the show notes, but there's literally tons of them out there. So they're just examples. Um, so let's say that you've done kind of your self-assessments and you realize that you're feeling like buying a home is something that you want to do or you have a timeline for when you want to do it. Uh, how do you think you should get started? You might want to start looking around for homeowner assistance programs, for instance, that might be a good first step to take. We talked about other steps you might take. For instance, the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, commonly called HUD or HUD, has a whole webpage dedicated to homeownership assistance in Illinois, which we can link to in the show notes as well. You may even look at your community development programs for resources within your municipality or county that, that can help you get funding or even counseling to help you get started to buy a home. So at this point, you'll probably want to know in, in the process of buying a home, you're probably going to want to know how much you need for that down payment to qualify for a home loan or mortgage. And there are a lot of calculators out there that can help, but let's back up a little bit first. 
what is a down payment, right? So a down payment is the amount of money you need in order to qualify for a loan. Generally, the bigger your down payment, the more choices you have for the type of loan you can get. There's a whole lot of information with, with mortgages. And like I said, for me, like depending on the type of loan, it could also maybe lower your monthly payments. There's a whole lot there. We are going to do a whole episode dedicated to just mortgages because there, like I said, there's a lot there. So that will be coming up next. So listen, listen for more detailed information about that. But so in general, that is what the down payment is, what you, what you can bring to the table to, to purchase with automatically. Um, there are some cases that you may still be able to purchase a home without a down payment. Um, if you are a veteran or a service member, a rural resident, or a first time home buyer, you may be eligible for certain programs for home ownership assistance that Andrea mentioned earlier. You also may have heard that you need a 20% down payment to buy a home. This is not true. However, you will avoid paying private mortgage insurance, PMI, if you have at least a 20% down payment. So what is private mortgage insurance or PMI? For those conventional loans where you don't have at least that 20% down payment of the purchase price of the house, you will have to purchase private mortgage insurance. That is separate than your mortgage. It's like an additional fee. So this type of insurance protects the lender, not you, if you stop making payments on your loan. So according to the CFPB, if you're refinancing with a conventional loan and your equity is less than 20% of the value of your home, PMI is also usually required. PMI was a totally new concept to me when we started looking for a house. I was like, what are you talking about? And basically, at least for me, in my situation, I mentioned our guy like kind of put together, you know, a formula spreadsheet. He included that for us. And he had told us at the time, most people do not come with 20% down payment for a house. So the majority of people have to do this PMI. And then the PMI is factored into your mortgage payment for the month. So it's not like you're paying, you know, one insurance company and then your mortgage company. It's all rolled into your mortgage bill, yeah. but it's, it, it's just not part of your mortgage. It's the special insurance with your mortgage. Yeah. And there are, there are ways that you could pay off your PM, PNI and, you know, like by payoff, I mean, you, you, there's lots of things that you're getting to more, on, more in the mortgage episode. Yeah. Um, but just, it's important, I think, to mention this during this home buying episode, because I know for me, I was like, what is this? I don't know what this is. Yeah. And it would be a surprise. You went to look at your mortgage and was like, what is this? I don't remember talking about this because when they go through the lending paperwork, they go so fast and they're like, here, sign this thing. And people are so exhausted. They don't always, they aren't always to, able to pay attention. Luckily, I knew about private mortgage insurance before I started the, the process of buying my home, but most people don't. That's something strange, especially for first time home buyers to know about that additional fee that protects the lender, not you. And the other thing to, to be aware of is that different types of loans have different requirements for minimum down payments. But the average down payment made on homes in the US in the last couple of years ranged from six to 12% of the value of the home, depending on the source and if they're looking at mean or median. Basically, like I said, most people are not putting 20% down. Most people are also having to pay this private mortgage insurance. Um, so for, for a little bit of context, what those numbers mean, the median listing prices for homes have gone up a lot over the past five to 10 years. 
So if the median listing price for a home in Illinois is $250,000, that means the down payment for 6% would be $15,000. A 12% down payment would be $30,000 and a 20% down payment would be $50,000. So that, those are what you would have to, that's what you'd have to come to the table with yeah. the day you sign your house. So when you're kind of starting to save for that down payment, remember that you're likely going to need some additional funds for closing costs and anything that may pop up when you move into the home, like furniture or appliances that could need to be replaced. Um, or like I said earlier, moving costs to get into the new home. So those are additional savings kind of goals that you might want to think about as well. So essentially, after you decide you want to buy a home, you'll want to estimate how much of a home you want to buy, and then you'll decide what your savings goal is for that home while you make sure to establish or maintain good credit. There's like all these things simultaneously you'll want to do to get your finances in order. And something else that a lot of people are curious about is the different players in the home purchasing game, so to speak. Um, you might have remembered that we interviewed Jeremy Reed from IDFPR's Division of Real Estate in episode 17 about the licensing requirements and many of the different stakeholders in the real estate business, like realtors or real estate agent or real estate brokers, whatever you want to call them, um, appraisers, inspectors. Uh, he also said that they license auctioneers and community association managers. You might um, be most familiar in the home buying process, at least if you purchased a home before, of realtors and appraisers and inspectors, since that's part of the, the normal process of buying a home. Um, there are lots of different people you may need or want to talk to throughout the home buying process. And the CFPB even mentions a network of advisors, which would include your family, friends, coworkers, and other people that you know that have recently bought a home or refinanced a mortgage that you can talk to or ask questions to. So that network of advisors might be helpful. And that's not like a clinically defined or professionally defined role, but it might be helpful for you in the home buying process. You also have lenders, right? You're going to have to contact lots of lenders to shop around for the best mortgage option for your needs. And each lender has different priorities when lending. So shopping around is the only way to find the best terms for you. You may have heard of something called a mortgage broker, which is different than like a lender because mortgage brokers do not lend money. They find you a lender um, and may work with many lenders to find loan options for you. And the CFPB also has some additional information on the difference between a broker and a lender if you're interested in learning more about those differences. There's also real estate brokers, as we mentioned earlier. So as a home buyer or a home seller, you'll likely deal with a real estate broker. The seller of the home or the condo or whatever property is being sold um, is the one that pays the commission to the realtor. And that commission would likely be split between realtors, um, any realtors that are involved in the sale of a home or property, if there are two, right? There might be one for the seller and one for the buyer. I had a realtor as a buyer. Nikki mentioned she had a realtor as a buyer as well but the seller paid the commission to my realtor. You might also speak to home inspectors. Most people choose to hire a home inspector when they're seriously interested in buying a home. Nikki mentioned that she hired one and it gave some more information <laughs> to help them make a decision on them. That was not the right home for them at the time. I would highly recommend if you could afford an inspection, given what we went through, that you do it. I also have another friend who didn't go through an inspection and she regrets it all the time because the house came with a lot more problems than she anticipated. Yeah. Um, and, and ours wasn't bad. I mean, they did say like, like the selling realtor was like, 
these, this is all fixable. Like we probably could have gone back and been like, all right, let's, can you fix this? Can you fix that? We chose not to do that just because at that point we were like, man, we didn't really feel that comfortable. But for example, an inspector is going to find something like in our case, one of the many issues was that they had finished a basement, which was nice but they clearly didn't have it done by a contractor. It was probably mm-hmm. like dad or grandpa yeah, like, yeah. You know, or grandma, like whoever, <laughs> you know, like redid it themselves, which is fine. It was just that it did cause some problems with like the furnace and the heating because they didn't necessarily do that correctly. Yeah. So it's stuff like that, that an inspector, like I wouldn't have known that on my own, but an inspector can, can let you kind of know that. Um, Another thing our inspector did at our current house was show us where some of our, on the side of our house, it was like settling kind of weird. So he was Mm -hmm. like, make sure you like get that checked out. So we did, and we did like um, some tuck pointing and stuff to fix it. So that's some things that an inspector can do for you. And they will list anything that's wrong, even if it's something small, like, uh, when I, I had an inspection done on my current home um, when I went to buy it and there were a bunch of things that I was like, I can fix, like change the railings so that they're to code, right? I could do that on my own. It was just buying different hardware, but they list literally anything that might be a potential issue. Um, and s- some people who are selling actually choose to have an inspection done and made available to any serious buyers but I would prefer to pay for my own inspection just because you don't know if someone had a friend who was an inspector, right? Um, You might also choose to hire a lawyer uh, to help kind of explain the loads and loads and loads of paperwork that you get to sign, for instance. Um, You could also hire them to represent you as a buyer or a seller using power of attorney for property. So in some states also, lawyers are required to be at your closing, for instance. Not in all states, but in some states they are required. So it might be an additional cost if you're moving out of state to consider. Um, And then there's also insurance agents that you'll get to talk to because you'll probably want to shop around for homeowner's insurance too, since that will be a requirement for any mortgage that you take out. So you're going to have to have homeowner's insurance. And there might be more people that you have to talk to, or some of these people may be referred to by different terms, depending on where you are, where you live, where you're looking to buy. It's important to remember that you are your own best advocate and each player in this process has something to gain or lose. So don't assume that anyone in this list that I've mentioned has a fiduciary responsibility to you. Other than a lawyer, a lawyer is legally supposed to have a fiduciary responsibility to you. That is a very good point. Um, So I know we're, we're kind of throwing a lot of terms at you, but we just want you to be aware of every, like these, key buzzwords um, if you're looking to buy a house. So there are a few more that we'll go through here that are just kind of out there as I I don't really, wouldn't really know where to put them. You know, if it's not like a, this is, you'll hear this during this part of your home buying process. They could come up at any time. So the first is a homeowners association or an HOA. So this is an organization that governs the community that the home is in, and that could be a subdivision, it could be a planned community, a condo building. Um, There are often additional fees to consider when choosing to live in a community governed by an HOA. Not all homes have an HOA, so asking about that and the fees, or even if there's certain rules, is important. So... I thought an HOA was really just like for townhomes and I didn't realize that like, no, an HOA can be for a house in the suburbs that doesn't look, you know, and and there may be different. um, My friend lives in one that, you know, they have their own park system and they have their own um, 
like they're not police, but like security that, that goes through all the homes and they're big homeowners association. So to, you know, to help keep things safe. So just things like that. So that's something to be aware of. Um, earnest money. This is the money that you pay to confirm the offer contract. It shows that you're serious about buying the home and you that you've made an offer on. It's not the same as your down payment. That's the important thing to remember. And, and so what's what would what would that difference be, Andrew? How would you describe it to somebody? So earn it, I had to pay earnest money. And it was like, I don't know, four hundred dollars I had to pay when I signed my contract for the offer. And I just paid it to the realtor or the real estate organization that I was working with. Um, but when I make my down payment, I had to make it to my lender, right? At closing. So I, I, the part of the reason why I asked that is I don't remember if I had to put earnest money down. Not, I don't think all real estate organizations would require earnest money, but most do. Like I was kind of surprised by it because I didn't think about there being a separate thing to, to have to pay when I bought my home, but then afterwards I was like, oh yeah, they need to know that I'm serious anyway. So I think it's more to make the, the seller understand that you're serious about the contract that you have um, provided, right, with the offer. Yeah. So I don't, I don't remember us having to do that. So it could, like you said, just be my experience versus yours. So, yeah. um, and then homeowners insurance. So we talked about homeowners insurance a little bit in our first part of the tackling insurance mini series we did. Patrice talked to us about the difference between homeowners insurance and renters insurance during that episode too. So um, to learn more about that, you could look back at at that podcast go back on um, but you do need to purchase homeowners insurance in Illinois so just keep that in mind another thing that you might run across is title insurance and this is different from homeowners insurance and private mortgage insurance since it protects you and the lender in case there is an error with the title or if there's like a lien against the property being purchased that you didn't know about when you purchased it or um, even the seller might not have known about it. So you can shop around for this type of insurance too, but most lenders will require title insurance in order to qualify for home loans. So that's important to understand. So many types of insurance to purchase when buying a home. So many. So many. Um, And then there's also appraisals. So an appraisal is the assessment of the value of something. IDFPR licenses appraisers or the people that are responsible for creating the valuation of a piece of real estate. Home appraisals are done for lots of reasons. So um, in the case of when they're done before the sale of a home, it helps lenders avoid losses on the loan. And that's kind of their role. And that's why a lot of appraisals are required in order to qualify for a loan. And then there is something called the origination fee. And this is a fee charged by a lender to cover the cost of processing the loan. They can exist on all types of loans, but it can be a sizable amount if processed as a percentage of a mortgage. It may be called an administration fee, processing fee, or underwriting fee. I believe mine was underwriting fee. Um, and, and I know we're throwing all these costs at you in these terms. Just know that like, if you have somebody, whether it's a mortgage broker, your real estate agent, they will walk you through the paperwork that shows all of this. So it's not like for us, it was one big bill. Yeah, you know what I mean? Like it wasn't necessarily that we were paying everything this one off, that one off, and it got, it was overwhelming, but like, you know. It's a it, line item in yes. like the long list of things that you're paying for. Correct. But it's important to know what all those line items mean so that someone doesn't sneak in some fee 
A hundred percent. I just didn't want people to think that it was one of these right. things where like, you're constantly like, here's $200 here and $400 there. Like it, think of it in terms of almost a, it's like a contract, just like Andrea said, and it'll be in your paperwork. So yeah. And then there's closing costs. So according to the CFPB, closing costs usually include mortgage and real estate costs, which can consist of, of origination fees and lender charges, points, third-party closing costs like appraisals and title insurance, taxes and government fees, prepaid expenses and deposits, and more. So basically, your closing cost is what you have to bring to pay all of these things that we've been talking about. So if you had, you know, uh, an appraisal done or inspection done or, you know, whatever it might be, that's what you're going to bring to close because when you walk out of there, you have to make sure all of those people got paid, that administration fee got, fee got paid, that, so, um, and that also doesn't, it's also your like first month mortgage payment, I believe. I think that depends on the type of loan. It depends on the loan and the details it, of the loan. And the, yeah. I think the one thing we've mentioned that isn't like something you pay at closing is the earnest money and possibly homeowner's insurance, depending on how you obtain it. Right. All of that may be unique to you. So, but yes people say cash to close our our guy kept telling us this is your cash to close like this is how much you need that day so um something to keep in mind um and then last but not least but escrow this is a type of account set up to pay for your taxes and insurance if you're using a mortgage to buy a home not all mortgages will require you to hold your taxes and insurance on the home in an escrow account but many will. This becomes a monthly cost that's rolled into the mortgage payment you make. If they underestimate how much money is needed for your annual property taxes, you'll get a letter asking for either a payment of the difference, or you can allow that additional amount to be rolled into the cost of your future mortgage payments. This was something I will never forget when I bought my first townhouse actually with my cousin. We got a bill sent to us you know, because then you get your tax bill for the year. We mm -hmm. definitely had this moment where we thought that we owed that much money again. And like, we panicked. I was like, no, 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 this is part of our mortgage payment. It's our escrow. <laughs> like we have, this is already taken care of. <laughs> but we had that alarming. little panic. Yeah. Um, so I think clearly from all the things that we discussed, buying a home is a complicated process. And even though we only covered, um, we've, we've covered a lot of the components in terms related to buying a home. Um, we probably didn't cover everything, which is why we'll, we will link to some really good sources for more information, like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, and there may even be like housing counseling services in your area that you can take advantage of to learn more about this process. And those counseling services sometimes are like a series of workshops that you might attend to learn more about the buying process, for example. And as a reminder, you can start researching costs of a home online now, even if you're not planning to buy for several more years. That will help you determine how much you'll need to have saved for down payment and potential closing costs. So thank you so much for joining us today. Next episode, as mentioned, we're planning to explore more about buying a home, including mortgages. And don't forget to subscribe to us on SoundCloud, Google Play, Apple Podcasts, or Spotify. Thanks for listening.